A number of people who frequent our work have requested a more detailed video regarding one of the mysteries we so often focus upon here on the channel. There are many sites that we feel are deserving of in-depth focus. Our mission has always been to enlighten those who may not have been aware of the many different, compelling, and often controversial realities surrounding countless ancient ruins that throughout their lives have been explained away with a lie. Undoubtedly, the most well-known, most commonly explored, and thus the ruin most suited for our viewers' acquirement of a knowledge armory is Giza. Indeed, there are many people you will meet throughout your life that will have delved into the mysteries of Egypt. However, this experience, unbeknownst to them, may have been fraught with a limited, illogical, academic account regarding the history of Giza's plateau. This video, then, is our gift to our viewer. To prove to all those who act like they know it all how little they actually do. The characteristics of the casing stones are undoubtedly one of our own most noted achievements. We feel little, if any, notice has been given to the facts we have realized regarding these stones. Yet the evidence we have found will remain clear for all to see. These casing stones, although of an enormous size and as such were left by a lost civilization, are far younger than the sandstone in which they encase. Most of these casing stones, unfortunately robbed out during invasions within the last few centuries, are protecting stones which are actually far more eroded and thus far older beneath. However, additionally, we began to wonder just how old could the Great Pyramids be? Could these eroding sandstones actually be concealing a far larger, far older structure beneath? Also discovered here on our channel, the supporting evidence to this hypothesis, most notably along the east side of Khufu and in numerous other places where the smaller sandstones have been robbed out, is, as we suspected, a far larger exoskeleton. We strongly believe these enormous megalithic blocks that we have previously estimated to be many hundreds of tons in weight are actually the original oldest blocks of the pyramids. We also believe that the more modern, currently recognized casing stones were actually inspired by these more heavily eroded smaller sandstone blocks, now concealing these mammoth megaliths. This makes the layers we believe that adorn the Great Pyramid numbers three, with the two more modern layers being conservation efforts, undoubtedly undertaken at vastly different times within history. Just how old is the Great Pyramid? Just how impressive was ancient Egypt? For example, the oldest surviving obelisk at Heliopolis, and therefore in Egypt, was undeniably cut, transported, and lifted into position at an unknown time in history, using now lost technology and knowledge. It is a stone 20 meters in height, weighing an astonishing 121 tons. And this enormous, unexplainable, impossible monolith is not the only one left upon the plateau. There are many more dotted all over Giza. For example, the sarcophagus of Amenemet III, a pair of quartzite monoliths, discovered in the early 20th century, hang above this supposed tomb. These gigantic stones effortlessly support the weight above, each estimated to weigh 110 metric tons. The Colossi of Memnon, these two gigantic artworks were built from single pieces of stone. They are orientated toward the sunrise at winter solstice, estimated to weigh anywhere from 600 to 1,000 tons each. Modern technology allows for the movement of such weights. However, any civilization claimed by academia, actually once being responsible for the transportation of such stones, is absurd. Who could have possibly transported such enormous stones to these locations? Not only transported them, but worked them into masterpieces they once were, disposing of all waste, presumably also weighing many tons. And there are many others. In the temple east of Khafre's Pyramid, for example, there lay blocks regularly, yet quietly estimated to weigh over 400 tons. How can modern academia claim such tasks were undertaken by our modern ancestors. 
Anyone aware of the true accomplishments involved in the construction of the Giza Plateau must now see this hypothesis as severely lacking any satisfactory explanations. Mortuary Temple of Menkaure still possesses some astonishing unexplained feats. There are some estimates of the blocks within the temple, most notably within the surviving walls of the mortuary, weighing as much as 220 tons. The heaviest granite ashlars, imported from Aswan Quarry many miles away, weighing in at more than 30 tons. There are many incredible, inexplicable features upon the Giza Plateau. Many of them, unfortunately, yet predictably, little shared academically. Yet it remains a place of invaluable existent truths, many discrediting that which are passed off as current academic fact. Giza is an astonishing place, and the one we feel most likely to expose academia once and for all. It is a plateau we find highly compelling. Firstly, many thanks to Ellen Lloyd over at AncientPages.com for her extensive research and writing on the conspiracy. Has a buried city within the Grand Canyon been covered up? The Hopi Indians have a traditional story told to them by their ancestors. It details the original pyramid builders living in an underworld in the Grand Canyon. Dissension arose between the good and the bad, the people of one heart and the people of two. Machetto, who was their chief, taught them how to leave the underworld. He caused a tree to grow up and pierce through the roof of the underworld, letting the people of one heart climb out. They settled by Passisvai, Red River, which is in Colorado, subsequently growing grain and corn. They then sent out a message to the Temple of the Sun, asking the blessing of peace, goodwill and rain for people of one heart, but their messenger never returned. Among the engravings of animals in the local caves is an image of a heart over the spot where it is said the entrance to be located. This legend was learned by W.E. Rollins during a year spent with the Hopi Indians. An article published in the Arizona Gazette reinforced this legend. Ever since the article appeared, there has been a lot of speculations whether an underground city actually exists. David Hatcher Childress, who examined the story, said, Perhaps the most amazing suppression of all is the excavation of an Egyptian tomb by the Smithsonian itself in Arizona. A lengthy front-page story of the Phoenix Gazette on April 5, 1909 gave a highly detailed report on the discovery and excavation led by a Professor S. A. Jordan of the Smithsonian. The World Explorers Club decided to check on this story by calling the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Speaking to a Smithsonian staff archaeologist, they told her that they were investigating a story from a 1909 Phoenix newspaper article about the Smithsonian Institution's excavation of rock-cut vaults in the Grand Canyon where Egyptian artifacts had been discovered, and whether the Smithsonian Institute could give me any more information on the subject. Her reply was as follows. The first thing I can tell you, before we go any further, is that no Egyptian artifacts of any kind have ever been found in North or South America. Therefore, I can tell you that the Smithsonian Institute has never been involved in such excavations. While it cannot be discounted that the entire story is an elaborate newspaper hoax, the fact that it was on the front page, named the prestigious Smithsonian Institution, and gave a highly detailed story that went on for several pages lends a great deal to its credibility. It is hard to believe such a story could have come out of thin air. Is the idea that ancient Egyptians came to the Arizona area in the ancient past so objectionable and preposterous that it must be covered up? Perhaps the Smithsonian Institution is more interested in maintaining the status quo than rocking the boat with astonishing new discoveries that overturn previously accepted academic teachings. Historian and linguist Carl Hart, editor of World Explorer, then obtained a hiker's map of the Grand Canyon from a bookstore in Chicago. Pouring over the map, they were amazed to see that much of the area on the north side of the canyon has Egyptian names. The area around 94 Mile Creek and Trinity Creek had areas, rock formations apparently, with names like Tower of Set, Tower of Ra, Horus Temple, Osiris Temple, and Isis Temple. Could these legends actually be true? As always, thanks for watching, guys. Take care. We have in the past covered but a few of the jewels that can be found in the crown of now lost civilizations which once dwelled within India. 
And since this, we have found the possible remnants of a number of different flourishments and additional devolutions within the granite historical record of our planet. Proof which we can now confidently demonstrate via a number of antediluvian sites which clearly display this cyclical behavior. The Elora Cave system, for example, one of the most well-finished and thus precisely executed, of which Kalish Temple, a site we have previously covered. Yet I digress. There is no possible way to define how long a religion can survive. As such, the fact that at least three different religious influences can be found upon these miraculous, enormous ancient ruins, once hewn directly from the bedrock of Earth, is proof enough of extraordinary antiquity. Along with these three different religious ages, our previous research among Elora's cave have ourselves found separate tool marks we feel logically left by a mere two separate civilizations, one of the famous cup and spoon mark era, claimed across northern Europe as Neolithic, while the other found upon Kalish and many others throughout India, indicative of yet another world-faring, yet far more globally powerful and capable, now lost civilization. According to modern paradigm, quote, the rock-cut activity at Elora Cave, three phases from the 6th century to the 12th century, the earliest caves, 1 through 12, discovered between the 5th and 8th centuries, reflect the Mahayana philosophy of Buddhism then prevalent in this region. The Brahmanical group of caves, 13 through 29, including the renowned Kalish, Cave 16, was excavated between the 7th and 10th centuries. The last phase, caves 30 through 34, reflecting the Jaina philosophy." End quote. However, what we do know for a fact, and quite contradictory to the aforementioned mainstream theory, is that this series of 34 caves were all indeed planned and constructed within the abilities available at the era of each of their constructions. Some indeed more modern and thusly planned and executed to a more primitive ability. But Kalish and many others along the network are and were incredibly, seemingly impossibly well executed, with unbelievable artistic and complex vision, created with technologies to cut rock of unbelievable and now lost and forgotten technologies, and thus abilities. It is popularly accepted belief systems attached to the sites are of a modern age, however, even this cannot be confirmed. Furthermore, we know that to create such a site would, in the modern age, take unimaginable effort and technologies, taking many, many years. Ergo, no matter what the mainstream explanation may be, or indeed the mounting areas of research and the enigmas we continue to stumble upon, adding to our list of areas of interest, all remain a growing and as yet unsolved mystery which we find highly compelling. Peru undoubtedly has one of the most compelling collection of ancient ruins that can be found anywhere on Earth. A vast collection of astonishingly well-preserved, incredibly ingenious, complex-designed ancient settlements, infrastructure, irrigation, agricultural designs, with countless others, often incorporated or accomplished through the creation of precisely executed, purpose-built structures with incredible features to accomplish built-in functions of astonishing ancient contraptions. Contraptions modern man has not only learned about through the building of these sites, but thanks to the brilliant condition of much of ancient Peru, the work of the as-forementioned polygonal civilization, one of four lost civilizations which we have personally identified here on the channel in prior videos. Feats of engineering which enabled us to use identified methods and signature stonework to ultimately verify the work of separate civilizations. Which due to modern belief systems and the profit and control this provides to those who profit from said societal infrastructures is actively hidden by a mainstream academia's morally destitute funding structure. Yet, regardless, these sites eventually deciphered and understood by modern studies. Moré, for example, is an ancient ruin that displays the levels of advanced knowledge that the builders once possessed. These step-like designs are also found at Ole Tambo, among others, 
although appearing as the steps of giants, were in reality used to acclimatize different plant species, often types of crops, herbs, and food producers to a different altitude to where they were native, allowing this ancient civilization to take food producing plant types high into the mountains. These extraordinary ancient builds, studied by countless talented individuals for many years, have now been decoded and understood in depth, in particular the infrastructure and the fact that it is unquestionably far too advanced to be publicly claimed as the work of the Incans. Thus, this has culminated in the academic world being forced to not only admit this, but do so in such a way that anyone who continues to press the issue soon realizes it is not only a confession in regards to their awareness of past, now lost, once highly advanced ancient civilizations, but is a broad categorization of said ruins as pre-Incan. And just like the incredible network of water channels previously covered, which connect many ancient settlements which allowed water to be pumped from places of abundance to places of drought, providing precious water supplies to countless ancient sites. The Yachttails are yet another collection of incredible ancient structures which you are unlikely to hear about in mainstream historical studies. Yachttails came in many shapes and sizes. These incredible builds were once enormous freezers not only used to create ice in cooler climates, but to store it during the hotter times of the year. These miraculous inventions, from spiral designs, wind tower designs, and ingenious vent placement designs, all assured cool air would continuously flow into vast underground portions of the structures. This either created ice or allowed ice to be stored and kept in a frozen state for an impressively long time. Refrigeration and the benefits of such were unquestionably understood by the builders of these structures. Yet modern utilization of the same methods of food storage, that being refrigeration via modern technologies, is only a very recent development, with much of the world, until the turn of the century, still salting meats. The question then is, how did this ancient civilization know about the benefits of cool storage? How did they understand how to build these structures? Where did such ideas and ultimate utilizations originate from? Was this knowledge possessed by an even older lost civilization? One in which the members responsible for the Yachttails were once members of? Yachttails, ancient refrigerators, are undoubtedly an incredible aspect of Peru's ancient relics. Relics which we find highly compelling. Many civilizations have been and gone here upon our planet. Countless artifacts and historical studies can and have been undertaken into their existence. We are able to decipher their daily lives, their religious beliefs and practices, even their languages. However, in doing so, we have never been able to decode any knowledge or explanation for the countless, seemingly impossible ancient feats, lost abilities of stonemasonry, no documentation found within any hieroglyph, literature, parchment, or other ancient text. Yet pyramids, polygonal masonry, multi-thousand-ton megaliths, along with countless other curious, clear signatures of a lost civilization's work exists. And due to this mystery regarding how these sites were created, we have to presume that those who constructed them were placed at a far earlier time within history, one that was prior to a global flood, possibly the aftermath of a near-extinction-level event, manifesting as a form of global amnesia and severing connections between continents, possibly for 10,000 years. Segesta within Sicily not only looks the same age as that of the foundation walls of Baalbek, and indeed the gargantuan megaliths found within the Trilithon. But the enormous temple is still standing along with its amphitheater, which, if we look to the still surviving polygonal stage flooring present at the theater within Delphi, a site we have covered in the past, one which is also littered with polygonal walls, we find more support for the theory that these amphitheaters, with their incredible acoustics, 
are also remnants left by this same lost civilization. Yet we feel the smoking gun are the protuberances which are still visible within its foundation blocks. It is of no surprise to us that its origins are hotly contested, with many academic teams concluding that it was merely the work of traveling Trojans, this regardless of the multi-ton columns that were so perfectly laid they all still stand to this day. When one considers that protuberances are found on polygonal masonry all around the world, and that modern stone masons are now exploring interlocking blocks, with some such as large Lego blocks already in mass production, it is no surprise that while many claim it to be Greek, others claim it not. This will not cease anytime soon. Many religious beliefs have gained traction in regard to its original purpose. Thus, conveniently, there is little chance that this contention will move forward. Who built the ruins of Segesta? When did they build them? We find the possibilities highly compelling. Many of the sites which we so often cover are not only attributed to what we believe is in reality a far more recent, well-studied, yet less controversial ancestor, one placed within permitted timelines. Indeed, many of these sites would have been incredible relics so far back within history, periods of development and difficulties, many ancient sites so well-built, thus resistant to weathering, that what we claim as merely re-inhabited locations often become the cradle of more recent academically permitted civilizational flourishment. It would also make sense on a strategic level to have claimed such miraculous technological advancements that these past constructions still displayed as their own handiwork, adopting, or rather hijacking said sites, making academia's job an easy one. For not only are these sites attributed to civilizations who would have been developing said technologies in their mere infancy, but these adopters of past high technology themselves claim to be the creators of said sites, this regardless of the incredible perfection present and the mastery of said sites on display, no matter how unlikely this level of efficient execution would have been, no matter how preposterous to assume they suddenly arose. Alas, this is exactly what one is expected to believe. The Royal Mausoleum of Mauritania, for example, located on the road between Churchill and Algiers, in Tempaza province, Algeria, is an impressive ancient structure, which we have discovered is actually hiding some telltale characteristics indicative of lost technology, and thus lost civilization. Claimed as that of a funerary tomb, like so many other sites we cover, dismissed of its controversial features and academically concluded as the burial site of the Berber king Juba II and Queen Cleopatra Selene II, both past sovereigns of Numidia and Mauritania, allegedly buried at the site. However, predictably, no human remains have ever been found at the site, and this is claimed to be due to tomb raiding. As mentioned here, there are particular features of the site not only hidden in plain sight, but we posit were probably noticed and deliberately ignored during mainstream explorations. False doors indicative of a lost civilization. Furthermore, note the size of the stones in which these and other frescoes have been carved into. Standing tens of feet high, several feet in length, and over a foot thick, these stones were far beyond the weight of what those who are academically claimed as the builders were capable of lifting. Clearly showing signs of an incredibly long life, with several of the build's old stone layers now all but eroded to dust, not only was the structure built to last, but we feel has in all possibility outlived a past now lost civilization. Who really built the Royal Mausoleum of Mauritania? How did they lift and place such gigantic stones? Why have these features seemingly been overlooked? Questions which desperately need answers. It is a site which we find highly compelling. The modern-day institution, man's way of organizing belief systems into their different clans, cult-like attitudes, often driven by an existential perception 
specialisms of some form or merely a naturally occurring passion. They are either built around a certain series of events or an apparent fact or claim, which stand as the cornerstones of said institution. It is therefore within the profiteers of said ideology's interests to not only suppress any evidence that may surface that would make their treasured institutions crumble to their very core foundation, but to actively destroy said relics whenever one gets an opportunity to do so. The Bamian Buddha, for example, apparently this monstrous carving perfectly bored into a sheer rock face in the Bamian Valley of central Afghanistan, is not only a relic, which we hypothesize, was left by a now lost civilization, but due to the facial features once masterfully depicted upon the statue, removed at some later time within history, carved flat, not only making its identification as Buddha questionable, it was for some reason completely destroyed during the Iraq War. Its destruction, I propose, supports our prior posit of it indeed being that of a lost civilization's work, this being the sole motive for such actions. Interestingly, hidden voids found behind the carving, if it were indeed a solid carving, as one would have once presumed when gazing upon it, how were these hollow chambers once placed behind said carving? Additionally, not only do most modern institutions deny any of the evidence we so often put forward on our channel, often in regards to a past lost civilization, but fields such as geology is simply actively writing off countless ancient sites and anomalies as simply geological coincidences, their existence being an impossibility according to already established, supposedly concluded chronology for human civilization. One reoccurring strategy, which I like to call the pareidolia effect denial, has befallen countless sites of interest. One of the most hotly debated, being the face on Mars, now simply dismissed as a trick of light, the intriguing pyramidal features nearby, which also somehow align with Pleiades. This denial strategy has condemned other said features here on Earth, some of which found in remote places that, according to modern academia, have simply never been inhabited. Thus, regardless of the artificial nature of such places as Gornia Shoria, must be dismissed as mere coincidental geological features. The ruins clearly immense age, often used, in an unfortunate twist of fate, as support of such claims, as nature eventually reclaims all, thus the older the ruin, the easier this said denial strategy is to argue. That is, until now, in a modern era, where modern technology now allows us to collect a massive amount of information on simply anything, unexplained features, who parts, and many other advanced unexplained legacies of an antiquity, once hidden, now shared far and wide, evidence which flies in the face of modern paradigm. The Sharanian is yet another of these curious, clearly immensely old anomalies that regardless of its form, once being carved from extremely tough rock, maybe this is why our lost ancestors built with such enormous stones and did so in an as yet unexplained yet clearly highly advanced way known as polygonal masonry. Perhaps they built like this so that their footprint here on our planet be long-lived, designed to deliberately be resistant to the elements, to reach us now in the modern day, giving all of us an opportunity to understand the real history of our Earth, regardless of what others would like. We find all of these things highly compelling.